Today, I'd like you to turn with me over to Philippians chapter 2. Today, we're going to talk about the kenosis passage. The word, word, Greek word kenosis means to empty. This is the passage in the Bible where it's talked about that Jesus emptied himself. And I want to discuss that with you today. There's been lots of discussion among theologians over the centuries about the meaning of this passage. So we're going to have some fun looking at this today. Let me read for you Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, or 1 through 11, the kenosis passage. Therefore, if any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, and ten on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness and empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This passage is talking about Jesus emptying himself and it's saying that we should have the same attitude that he had. Have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus. It's saying that this is what we should want to have in our lives as we live the Christian life. That we should live like Jesus lived. We, we should have the same attitude that he had. We should have the mind of Christ. This passage comes to the book of Philippians, which is a famous book. It's a, it's a great book. Uh, I've given you the background before, but I will briefly. In 49 AD, Paul was on his second missionary journey, and he had what's called a Macedonian call. Uh, he was intending to go up into Asia, but uh, the Holy Spirit told him to go over into Europe. The, the Philippian church was the first church planted in Europe. So he went over across the Aegean Sea to Philippi, and they didn't have a synagogue, so he preached on the riverbank, and he had a number of people become believers, uh, Lydia the Seller of Purple, the Philippian jailer. Uh, he was put in prison, but the Philippian jailer, God opened the doors, but he didn't leave, and the Philippian jailer said, what shall I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved along with your house. Paul was only there for two weeks because of all the persecution. He had been put in, in jail and he, uh, God got him out, but he was under, in danger, so he left. Uh, so he, he left his fledgling church there that he had started in two weeks, and he left his disciple Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, to be the pastor of the church, and he was pastor for five years. This church grew up into be a, to be a great church, one of the best that Paul planted, uh, they had the first building ever built in Christendom. Um, I'm, I'm told that you can visit that, that, the ruins of that church today. It, has a, it had bathrooms and had running water, which was uh, quite interesting at that time. And uh, Luke stayed there for five years. Uh, and Paul planted the church in 49 AD, but uh, he wrote the letter of to the Philippians in 63 AD, which was 13 years later. At this time, Paul had been in prison. He had been arrested for being a Christian and being a Christian preacher. He was in prison and he wrote the book with the theme, Rejoice in the Lord Always Again, I Say Rejoice, the theme verse. 
the joy of the Lord is the theme. And he, he was joyful even though he was in prison because the church had been so faithful to him. Uh, they had sent one of their elders, Epaphroditus, to give him money and minister him in prison. And he was writing the letter to express his joy and to thank them for all that they had done. And also to warn them about certain things. So this passage is found in that book, a great book. It begins with an appeal by Paul to the church for unity and love. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. This is one of four times where the word joy is used in the book. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit. So he tells them, what I'd like from you is a unity of mind, spirit, and purpose. The Great Commission is your purpose. I want you to be unified around that. I want you to love each other. I want you to be unified in mind, not fight and bicker and complain. To look after each other better than you look after yourself. He, he says that in the next verse. Do nothing from selfishness and empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard what another is more important than yourself. That's kind of hard for we human beings to think of other people as more important than ourselves. But that's the way Jesus lived. He thought of others as more important than himself. And he wants us to do the same thing to the best of our ability. He said, we all are selfish. We have such high regards for ourselves. We all are selfish and proud. We need to, through the Holy Spirit, get a handle on that and become servants. We need to not practice selfishness and empty conceit. Empty conceit means being proud even though we don't have a reason to be proud. So humility is not thinking of yourself first, but thinking of others. He said, do nothing from selfishness and empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. This is the attitude that Jesus wants us to have. He wants us to care about each other more than we care about ourselves. He wants us to look out, not look out for our own personal interests, but for the interests of others. I heard a story from a missionary friend of mine about a, a farmer in a third world country who was a rice farmer. And he, he had become a Christian and had been radically changed and born again. And he had a, this small farm up on a mountainside and they had these steps, you know, these uh, different plateaus of the mountain. Well, he would get up in the morning and he would pump water up the mountain with using a foot pump, water into his rice paddy up on the side of the mountain. Well, one of his unscrupulous neighbors down the, down the mountain, the guy next door, the guy down, would, would break his dike and steal his water every day. He would pump the water into his field and then the, the, um, his neighbor would come and steal his water. Well, he went to the authorities. They wouldn't do anything. He talked to the guy. He wouldn't do anything. What do you do? Get a gun and shoot him? I mean, what do you do? Um, what he decided to do was he got up twice as early every morning, and he put, pumped water into his own field, and then he went down and pumped water into his neighbor's field. And, of course, his neighbor didn't steal his water because he already had some that he'd pumped for him, and... Later, his neighbor became a Christian because of that act of servitude, of being a servant. That's what Jesus would do. You know the old little saying that they used to have, what would Jesus do? That's what Jesus would do. And he did what Jesus would do. The goal of our sanctification is to grow to be more like Jesus, to be more Christ-like, to have his attitude in ourselves which was also in him, to think like he thought, to have the mind of Christ, to do like he did, to follow his teachings about our personal living. And they're not easy to follow. Teachings like love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies, do good to those who spitefully use you, do not return evil for evil. If someone asks you for a shirt, give him your coat also. 
Turn the other cheek. Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be a servant. These are not easy things to follow. But that's the way Jesus was. That's what he did. He's not asking us to do anything that he didn't already do. And I, I would submit to you that this is what sets us apart from the world. The world never does these things. The world never does these things. The world would never get up early and pump water into the neighbor's field because of what Jesus said to do to be a servant. The world is not geared to be servants. The, the world is geared to take and to try to make people their servants. So Paul tells us how to do this. When he says to us in verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we have to understand about Jesus' attitude in order to be able to emulate it. Jesus sets our example. If we seek the mind of Christ, we will be like him. We will have his attitudes and we will have his actions. Because if you have a true attitude, it does lead to action. The Bible says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's what Jesus calls us to do. So look at what Jesus did. This is the kenosis part of the passage. Although he existed in the form of God, that word is form essence, he was in the essence of God. He was God. Even though he was God, he did not regard equality with God a thing, a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on to it. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So he emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? What does it mean that he emptied himself? That's the discussion that's been going on for, for centuries. Well, one translation says he made himself of no reputation. He was God and he became just a simple carpenter. Another translation says he gave up his position and privileges. He was God and he had a right to that position, but he gave that up to become a man so that he could be our savior. I'm reminded of the story of Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer was a, a concert pianist. He was the toast of Europe. He was one of the best pianists in Europe. But God called him to be a missionary to Africa, and he gave that up. He gave that position of being this great pianist up in order to become a missionary in Africa. Another translation puts it this way. He gave up his rights. He emptied himself. He gave up his rights. What rights did Jesus give up? Well, I don't know if you realize this, but he became a, the God-man. He became man and God. He took on the likeness of a man. He became the God-man, and he gave up such, such, certain of his godly prerogatives while he was here on earth. Jesus did not have omniscience here on earth. He didn't know everything. He found out as the Holy Spirit revealed it, him, it to him. When the Bible says he was tempted in all things like we are, yet was without sin, he, it's not talking about some fake temptation that Jesus would know what was going to happen and that's the reason he could overcome it. No, he, he faced the temptations the same way we did. He, he was tempted, truly, really tempted. And then he, because of the Holy Spirit working in his life, he, he didn't sin. He was tempted in all things like we are, Yet he was without sin. He gave up his omniscience. He gave up his omnipotence. Yes, he had great power. He could heal. He could raise the dead. But he got that power from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. He did not hold on to the power he had in heaven. He gave that up and he had to go through the Holy Spirit and go through the Father to get the power that he used. He never knew when he would have it. He prayed for it like we do. And he gave up his omnipresence. As God, he was everywhere all at once. 
And as he became a man, he was in one place. That's the reason he said, it's to your benefit that I go away because then the Spirit will come and I will again be everywhere. I will be, be everywhere. It's your benefit. Now I'm just in one place. That's what he meant when he said, the works I do, you should do in greater works than these because I go to the Father. Because Jesus never went, he never left the geographical boundaries of Palestine. But we can go places he never went. Now he is everywhere again. He is, he, he is, he is taking back up his godly prerogatives. He has his omniscience. He has his omnipotence. He has that omnipresence. But he gave those things up in order to become our Savior. He gave those things up for a time in order to become our Savior. He gave up his rights. I read this interesting story <coughs> called the Pineapple Stories. An interesting story about giving up your rights. Um, these missionaries went to this primitive culture and the people wouldn't listen to them. They wouldn't listen to anything they said. <coughs> they gave them all kinds of medicine and various other things and they still wouldn't listen to them. Well, the missionaries uh, were pretty comfortable. They had a compound and they planted this pineapple garden, this pineapple garden. But the natives kept stealing all their pineapples. And it would make them all mad, the, the missionaries. These are our pineapples. We planted these pineapples. And so they would punish them by not giving them supplies and by, you know, they would punish the, the natives. And they just made them steal them all the more. Finally, one of the missionaries said, maybe we should give up our rights to the pineapples. And so they went to the chief and they said, look, we no longer claim the right to these pineapples. You can have all you want. And you know, they didn't steal as many, and they started listening to them. Because they did something that the normal person would not do. They gave up their rights. The verse also says he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He, he had a right to be honored as God, but he gave up certain of his godly prerogatives. He didn't hold on to them, and he took the form of a servant. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom to many. He became a servant. He, was, he became a bond servant. A bond servant is someone bound to another. And he became a bond servant to us. He bound himself to us, his people, those whom God had chosen before the foundation of the world, to come and be our Savior. He did what we could not ever do for ourselves. And he, was, he, was, he, he took the appearance of a man. And being found in the likeness of a man, he, he, he became obedient to the point of death. He became a man. I don't know if you realize it, but Jesus, as a man, he had all the, he went through all the things, not only the temptations, he was tempted in all things we are, yet without sin, but he went through all the pains and rigors of being a man. He had diaper rash. You know, he, he had, got colic. Uh, he had hunger from time to time. He went through pain. He, he worked in man, as a manual laborer of carpenter until he was 30 years old. He went through, he, he walked on the dusty road to this world. He got blisters. Um, he, he went through all the pains and anguish of being human. He did it so he could be our savior. He did it so he, he could be our savior. And then it says he humbled himself to the point of death even death on the cross. He humbled himself to the point of death. Not only did he live a perfect life, being tempted in all things as we are yet without sin, so he could give us his perfect righteousness and we could stand before God righteous. Not only did he do that, but he, he, he died a perfect death on the cross. He allowed, he said he could have called down 72,000 angels and wiped out his enemies, but he didn't do that. He let them put him on the cross. He let them put him on the cross. He let them put him on the cross because that's the only way we could be saved. We used to have discussions in seminary about could God have saved us in some other way? I don't know if you ever thought about that and we used to talk about it and we came to the conclusions, no, there was no other way that we could be saved. In fact, it says that 
Acts 4.12. There's no other name given among men by which we may be saved. There's no other way. God's justice had to be satisfied. And it could not be satisfied by us, so someone had to do it. The only one that could do it was God himself, because only God could die the infinite death necessary. But yet he had to be a man so that he could represent us as a man. So he could represent us. It, it was, the, it was the, the, the necessity of the incarnation. He had to become a man so that he could uh, represent us, and he had to be God so he could die this infinite death. You see, on the cross, he died for all of your sins, past, present, and future concentrated on that time. He underwent the punishment you would have to undergo in hell if you die without his grace. He, uh, he underwent the punishment you would have to undergo in hell on the cross for you. He substituted for you. He sacrificed himself for you. He was the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. He bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God. He died for sin once for all, the just, he's, he is the just. For the unjust, we are the unjust, that he might lead us to God. He had great physical suffering. We know the stories. If you've ever watched some of the films uh, about it, he, ha he was improperly and falsely tried, uh, false witnesses, testified against him he was beaten with a cat of nine tails with metal balls on the end and they let it they put a robe on his back let it dry and they ripped the robe off they, they put on a crown of thorns and they nailed the thorns into his scalp he had to carry his own cross he was nailed into in his wrist and in his feet onto the cross and probably one of the most painful things of all was that he, he came to his people his own people and they would not receive him and they taunted him and cursed him. The Bible says, cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. And he took that curse for us. His physical suffering was great. But even greater than that was his, cosmic, what I call his cosmic suffering. Because in the, in the, in, in the heaven, he, he paid for our sins. His cosmic suffering was much greater than his physical suffering because can you imagine what it would be like to go through hell for us in our place uh, to go through the the spiritual suffering he had to undergo to die for you mine and your sins past present and future so he became obedient to the point of death even death on the cross now this doesn't mean that he ceased to be God he was the God man he had to be God to save us he had to be man to represent us. A theologian said he remained what he ever was, but he became what he never was. He became the God-man, and he took on that flesh forever. Do you realize that he is still the God-man? He didn't quit being the God-man. He just took up his godly prerogatives. He is still the God-man in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. He became a man forever. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hell incarnate deity. So you see the necessity of the incarnation. When we have Christmas time, we're celebrating the time when God became a man so that he could be our savior. He could do for us what we could not do. He cared and he came. That's the attitude he wants us to have. He cared about us. He loved us. And so he was willing to come and die on the cross for our sins. He didn't just sit up in heaven on his throne and wring his hands and say, something needs to be done about those people. No, he cared and he agreed as the second person of the Trinity to come and to die for our sins. To be the designated scapegoat. To be the Lamb of God. He loved us and he gave himself for us. And he tells us, you are to have the same attitude. Boy, what a task. Have the same attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. In order to do that, you need to be willing to give up your reputation. You've got to stop caring what people think about you. And you've got to start doing what God wants you to do. You need to give up your rights and privileges. Not hold on to them. 
Take a position as a servant. When you see needs around you that God is calling you to, to meet, you need to go. Just like Jesus cared and he came, we need to care and we need to go. I remember one of the peanut uh, cartoons, uh, Snoopy is, is sitting on this hill shivering in the cold. Charlie Brown walks by, by and he says to him, be warmed and be filled, Snoopy, and he walks on by. He didn't help him at all. He just gave him a platitude. And then another story about a lady. That's not what, that's not what you want to do. But another story about a lady who was in a church, and one of the members of the church was sick. And she said, are we helping the lady? Nobody was. So she went. She went and she cleaned the lady's house. She cooked her meals. She looked after her and helped her. That's what Jesus would have done. One of my favorite uh, Christian films is a film called The Ordinary Guy. Uh, it's about an ordinary guy who lives in, in the suburbs of this big city and he's riding through the city and he sees all these gang kids playing on the, on the sidewalk and he has this burden that God gives him. He feel, he's, he's listening to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit says, go and help those people. So he starts his ministry in the inner city for, the, for these kids. He has hundreds of kids in his ministry. He's being very, very successful in his work in the inner city. And people say to him, well, why are you doing that? Uh, what are you getting out of that? He said, this is what God has called me to do. This is what God has called me to do. He was engaged to this beautiful girl, and she left him because she didn't like what he was doing. But he kept doing it, and one day he was accidentally killed uh, in a gang shooting. They weren't going after him, but he was just accidentally shot. He was dead. And they were, they were at his funeral, and his ex-girlfriend said, oh, what a waste, he wasted his life. And just at that moment, a thousand gang members walked into the cemetery and put their guns in his casket. A thousand gang members, this is a true story, walked into the cemetery and put the, their guns in his casket. Did he waste his life, my friend? He did what God was calling him to do. He paid the price. He was willing to be like Jesus, to give up his reputation, to give up his privileges. So it concludes with God's response to what we do, what Jesus did and what we did, what we do. He says, for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name. He, he took back up his godly prerogatives. He became the king of kings and lord of the lords again. He took his place on the throne. Bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. So that the name of, name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Now notice it says there that every knee will bow, every one. Some knees will bow, our knees I hope will bow in adoration and worship when Jesus returns. But some knees will bow in guilt and condemnation. Every knee is gonna bow I mean, you, you, can, you can act like God is, uh, God is not there. You can act like Jesus is not real. But at some point, you're going to bow the knee before him. It's either going to be in condemnation or it's going to be in exaltation. Because Jesus died for us and we're now in his family and we're now his brothers, he, he has exalted us. We now are seated at the right hand of God. We're now heirs and co-heirs with him. He has exalted us. God exalted him. He has now exalted us. He was the suffering servant. Now he's king of kings, king of kings and lord of lords. It's the same with us. What we do now is we do what he did. We have the attitude in ourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. We become last so that we can be first. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. We're willing to put ourselves last to take the form of a servant so that we can eventually will be elevated to this great position. Jesus said when you go to a banquet, don't sit on the front seat. 
because the host might sit you in the back seat. Sit on the back seat so the host will move you up to the front seat. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Before the crown must come the cross. He tells us to take up our cross daily. He tells us to have the attitude in ourselves which is also in Christ Jesus. Like Jesus who did not come to serve but to be served, to, to be served but to serve and give his life for ransom for many, we are to do the same thing. He said when he washed the disciples' feet, a servant is not greater than his master. We need to be willing to figuratively wash the feet of others who have needs. My son was a missionary in Sarajevo, Bosnia for 10 years. When he got there, he found that we had a relative that was a famous person in that country. Uh, her name was Adeline Irby. She was a British subject who came to that country as a missionary. And that country has been through all kinds of wars and struggles and difficulties. But she set up shop during World War II and she fed the people, she helped the people, she raised money in England to bring to the people. She started the first schools. Because of her, that country is a moderately Muslim country because the girls go to school in that country. Uh, she started schools for girls. She became a pretty famous person. In fact, now in that country, uh, her birthday is a national holiday. Uh, somebody wasn't even born in the country. And so he was walking down the street in Sarajevo where he, was, where he had his headquarters, my son, and he saw the street, Irby Avenue. He said, who is that now, Irby Avenue? I mean, my name's Irby, what, what's, what's going on? So he researched, he found out about Adeline Irby. He wrote a book about her. It became a bestseller in Bosnia. He spoke on TV and, you know, before the governor and everything else. In fact, the fact that he was related to Adeline Irby gave him an indoor, a door into the culture that he could not have found in any other way. So he wrote this book and, and, and it really helped his ministry in that country. But Adeline Irby became, she was a servant. She spent her entire life serving the people of Bosnia and now they have elevated her. They have elevated her to a high position in that country. That's what God says he will do. If we put ourselves last, he will make us first. We don't have to try to make ourselves first. If we become a servant, then he, he will, if, we, if we'll take the cross, we will get the crown. So, in conclusion, keep in mind that none of us are ever perfect servants. We keep putting ourselves on the altar, but the only problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. We put ourselves on the altar, but we crawl off of it again. So we need to ask ourselves the question, not are we a perfect servant, but are we growing more and more like Christ? Are we growing more and more to have his mind, to have the attitude in ourselves that he had? Do we have this attitude of sacrificial servanthood? Are we learning to regard others as more important than ourselves? Or do we still think of ourselves as the most important? Are we growing in our Christ likeness? Do we listen to the Holy Spirit like in that movie, The Ordinary Guy? Do we, are, are we listening for him to call us to meet a need, to build a bridge into the church, uh, to build a bridge to Christ through our efforts? Are we, are we looking at the world and seeing the needs of the world around us? We all will serve differently. The Holy Spirit will call us to different things. We have different gifts. So some of us are good at one thing and some of us are good at another. We, we serve in different ways. And God, but are we listing? Are we listing? Are we going? Are we caring and going like Jesus did? Do we have the attitude in ourselves that was in Christ Jesus and is it growing? I would submit to you finally the last point is if you're a selfish non-servant, if you do what it says in verse 3, if you act in selfishness and empty conceit, then you're probably not a Christian. Because every Christian knows 
that Jesus sacrificed himself and that he's calling us to act like him. Are you sacrificing yourself in some way? If you're not, if you never have, then you're probably not a Christian. You need to go back up there on the bowing the knee part and you need to bow the knee now before it's too late because when Christ comes, it's gonna to be too late. You're gonna bow in condemnation. Bow now and accept him as Savior and Lord and then set about to live a life where you have the same attitude in yourself that was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we come today and we thank you as we have communion today. Lord, help us to look into our hearts. We're supposed to see if we really know you. We're supposed to see if we're being obedient to you. Lord, if we are being, being selfish, if we have any conceit, help us to confess that today. Before we take communion, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.